The Geneva Lecture Series was founded in 1976 with the purpose of presenting the university community with the challenge of the continuing relevance of the Judeo-Christian message to contemporary life. We believe that good scholarship and faith commitment are not mutually exclusive. To that end, we have invited speakers from within and outside the academic community who are conversant with the general topic of how Christian faith, how their Christian faith relates to their particular intellectual discipline or area of interest. To date, we have brought, uh, including Dr. Planinga, 60 speakers to the University of Iowa from a wide variety of disciplines and professions to demonstrate that all truth is God's truth and that the Judeo-Christian message continues to be relevant to contemporary life. Dr. Planinga has been called the leading philosopher of God. He has led the revival in Christian philosophy for the past 30 years. He has been elected president of the Society of Christian Philosophers and the American Philosophical Association. He has delivered the prestigious Gifford and Wild uh, lectures and was granted an honorary doctorate from Glasgow University. His influential works include 90 article, articles. Among his many books are God and Other Minds, God, Freedom, and Evil, and his famous, famous Warrant trilogy, Warrant, the current debate, warrant and proper function, and warranted Christian belief. Dr. Planinga received his uh, BA from Calvin in 1954 and a PhD from Yale in 58. He has taught philosophy at Notre Dame for 21 years, I think. Prior to that, he taught at Calvin College for 19 years. Uh, he says that he spends uh, too much time flying around the United States uh, speaking and not enough time rock climbing. So help me welcome Professor Planinga. Uh, well, let me say, as I said this afternoon, that um, it's a pleasure to be here again. Um, I, I think this is my third visit to the University of Iowa, and um, I'm glad to be here. It's a bit warm, perhaps, in here. I'd like to say that uh, you really can't blame that on me. I have nothing to do with that. That's just, just life. Um, I also suspect, given that there are quite a few of you, that not nearly all of you are philosophers or majors in philosophy. And uh, that may be deplorable, but that's, but that's um, just the way things are. So I might have to begin by convincing you of the importance of philosophy. I'd like to tell you a little bit about philosophy and how important it is. And uh, the fact is philosophy shows up at the very highest levels of our public life, way at the top with the presidents. So for example, George Bush Pear, the father, uh, when someone was, when he was being criticized, they were saying that things weren't going as well as they should on his administration and things just weren't up to snuff. He said, well, I can tell you this, things aren't nearly as bad as they would be if they weren't as good as they are. That's, that's philosophy. And, and here he was only following the lead of uh, Dwight David Eisenhower, whom I remember very well, whom I imagine hardly anybody else here does. But anyway, Dwight David Eisenhower was once being criticized. People were saying, your, your administration is terribly old-fashioned, Eisenhower. You should, you should get with it. He said something like this. He said, uh, well, I don't know about that, but I can tell you this. Uh, things are a whole lot more like they are now than they've ever been before. <laughs> and uh, lest you think that I'm picked just on Republicans, uh, Bill Clinton, in addition to his um, disquisitions, semantical disquisitions on the use of the word is, also, also once uh, said this, he said, he said, well, if you're all like me, and I know I am, so and so and such and such. <laughs> So that's philosophy. Now, now, now you see, you know, philosophy plays a role at the very highest levels of our uh, public life. This paper is entitled An Evolutionary Argument Against Naturalism. It could be called um, 
naturalism versus evolution, as you see it just down there on the, uh, on the sheet. And I hope everybody has one or has one available to look at, because it's going to make life a lot easier if you do. Um, it's, it's very common to think of evolution and naturalism as uh, fitting together nicely. And you might even think of evolution as a kind of pillar in the, uh, in the temple of naturalism. As a matter of fact, Richard Dawkins once said that evolution makes it possible to be, a, to be an intellectually fulfilled atheist. You see it there on, on the sheet. So, so um, but I want to argue that as a matter of fact, they don't fit together well at all. In a certain very important and deep way, they conflict with each other. Um, when I speak of naturalism, I mean a view about what there is. Naturalism is the view that there isn't any such person as God, as the God of Judaism, Christianity, Islam, or anybody or anything at all like God, all right? So no such person as God or anything or anybody at all like God. You might think of it as um, high-octane atheism, atheism plus, you might say. You can be an atheist without rising to the depths or may, uh, rising to the heights or maybe falling to the depths of being a naturalist. You can be an atheist without being a naturalist, but you can't be a naturalist without being an atheist. So if you're a naturalist, you think there's uh, not only no such person as God, but nothing very much like God. So if you believe, say, in Hegel's absolute, then you might be an atheist, but you wouldn't really be a naturalist. Or if you believed in Plato's idea of the good, or uh, possibly Aristotle's thinker that thinks always and only about himself, then, then you, you might be an atheist without being a naturalist. But you can't be a naturalist without being an atheist, all right? And what I want to argue is that there is a conflict between evolution and naturalism. And when I speak of evolution, I just mean what we learn in school, um, in high school and college, that, uh, that it's by virtue of this process of descent with modification that you find all the wide variety of flora and fauna, animals and plants that we do in fact see around us, that first. And second, uh, a specifically Darwinian component that what has driven this whole process of descent with modification is really natural selection working on some source of genetic variation. The usual candidate is random genetic mutation, all right? So you get a random genetic mutation in a population of animals of some kind, let's say, let's just say animals. Um, well, maybe this mutation is heritable, and maybe furthermore, it's adaptive. It enables the creatures that have it to do a little better in the, uh, in the evolutionary race, the evolutionary derby, than others, so it may uh, it may spread through the whole population, and then the whole process can start over again. So by virtue of repeated occurrences of that kind, you get all the enormous variety of uh, plant and animal life that the world, in fact, displays. Now, I'm not going to argue against evolution, and I'm not going to argue against naturalism. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'm inclined to believe in evolution, at least certain parts of it. Uh, but I'm not inclined to believe at all in naturalism. But what I want to argue is that you can't sensibly accept the pair of these things together. Maybe one, maybe the other, but not the two together. That's the, that's the main thought. Okay, so, so here's the problem then. I want to start by talking about the problem, and I want to start by talking about theism, the view that there is such a person as God. Theism is that, together with the idea that we human beings have been created by God, and God is a holy, good, holy, knowledgeable, all-powerful person that is a being that has knowledge, that has aims, um, has intentions, has loves and hates, likes and dislikes, and can act to accomplish these aims. All right? So that's what I'm thinking of a person. On the theistic picture, there is God on the one hand, who um, has always been there, is eternal, um, is necessary, couldn't have failed to exist. And on the other hand, there is what he's created, the created world, which is dependent on him for its existence and for its continued existence, all right? So we've got God and creation. Now, naturalism, you might think of, sort of, as like the theistic picture without God. So you've just got nature and not God and nothing very much like God. Examples of naturalists you'll find on the sheet there are uh, examples would be the late Carl Sagan, Stephen Jay, the late Stephen Jay Gould, uh, the philosopher David Armstrong, the philosopher John Dewey, the philosopher Bertrand Russell, uh, Daniel Dennett, Richard Dawkins, Peter Atkins, and lots and lots of others. 
Some people, for example, uh, John Lucas at Oxford, say that naturalism is the new orthodoxy of the academy, of the Western Academy, the academy in the United States and Western Europe. Not the academy, say, in Iran, but in the United States and Western Europe. Okay, so that's naturalism. And my argument will have to do with, um, you look at the sheet there, our cognitive faculties, cognitive faculties, all right? Um, our cognitive faculties are just the faculties or processes that form, that are involved in our forming beliefs. So we've got memory, let's say. You remember what happened um, 50 years ago. I do, you probably don't. You remember what happened uh, 10 minutes ago. Uh, perception, by virtue of perception, you form beliefs about what your immediate environment is, all right? Um, uh, reason, in, a, in the narrow sense, whereby you know about mathematics and logic. You form the belief that 7 plus 5 equals 12 by virtue of reason. So those are uh, among the faculties. Those are listed there, I think, yeah. Uh, memory, perception, reason. There are still others. For example, um, the faculty whereby you know what somebody you're talking with is thinking and feeling, all right? You might call that uh, sympathy. That's what Thomas Reed, the great Scottish philosopher Thomas Reed, calls sympathy. There's also induction, whereby you uh, can uh, learn from experience. I mean, you learn from what's happened to you so far what to expect, all right? So if, uh, if all the crows you've ever seen have been black, you'll be inclined to think the next crow is black. If the sun has risen every morning, you'll be inclined to think it rises tomorrow morning. And um, there are others as well. Now, from the point of view of theism, we human beings being created in the image of God, who is uh, the prime knower, from the point of view of theism, it's natural to think that our cognitive faculties, these faculties that produce such beliefs, are on the whole, if not necessary in every detail, on the whole reliable. On the whole, they provide us with true beliefs. And that's what their purpose is. We are created with these faculties in order that we could have true beliefs on a wide variety of, of uh, topics, in this respect resembling God himself. So we can know about the past. We can know about uh, the far reaches of the solar system and indeed of the whole universe. We can know about other people and what they think. Um, you, can have, you can have an entire book just about somebody's remembrance of a party, something like that. So there, there is uh, this kind of far-flung and very detailed set of beliefs that we can have about the world due to our cognitive faculties. And from the point of view of theism, the natural thing to think is, for the most part, they're right. Okay, so Thomas Aquinas here, here's a quotation from the great Catholic, I mean the great philosopher Thomas Aquinas. He sort of, uh, I can't really say he himself was a Catholic since this was before the Protestant Reformation. I mean, uh, somebody, one, a student once submitted a paper at Hope College, so I was told, in which this, the, the student said that, uh, uh, that Jesus Christ was a Catholic because this occurred before the Protestant Reformation. All right, well, I don't know if that's the right way to think. But anyway, here we've got Thomas Aquinas. He says this, only in rational creatures, creatures with ratio or with reason, only in rational creatures is there found a likeness of God which counts as an image. Human beings are in the divine image. As far as the likeness of the divine nature is concerned, rational creatures seem somehow to attain a representation of that type. So rational creatures, um, attain a representation of being like the divine nature in virtue of imitating God not only in this that he is and lives and we too are and live but especially in this that he understands and so do we so a central part of the divine image in human beings according to Thomas Aquinas is um, our resembling God with respect to knowledge and most of us would think or at least on reflection would think that at least a function or purpose of our cognitive faculties is to provide us with true beliefs. That's what they're there for. That's why God created us that way, so we could have true beliefs. It's, of course, true that, um, and we also think that when they function properly, when there's no cognitive dysfunction, when there's no insanity, let's say, or some milder version of cognitive dysfunction, then for the most part, that's what they do. It's true, of course, that um, if there is an automobile accident with five witnesses, you might get five different stories. Um, but there will be a deeper level of agreement. There will be a level agreement as to where, roughly speaking, the accident occurred. 
It won't be that some people say it was Los Angeles and others say, no, it was Calcutta. There will be uh, agreement on roughly how many vehicles are involved, were involved in the accident. It won't be that one person says, uh, well, this guy was driving along and fell asleep at the wheel and hit a tree. And somebody else says, no, 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 it was one of those 95 car Los Angeles freeway crack ups. So there'll be agreement of that sort. Um, and there'll be a much deeper level of agreement beneath that. I mean, people will agree that indeed there are automobiles, that they are uh, used by human beings to accomplish their purposes, which very often have to do with getting somewhere, that um, they're seldom driven by three-year-olds, uh, that they won't work well on the surface of the moon or at the bottom of the ocean, that if you drop them out of helicopters, they tend to fall down rather than up. There'll be a whole host of sort of, a, of a deeper level agreements here. Okay, um, but now here's my question. Isn't there a problem here for the naturalist? For the naturalist, at any rate, for the kind of naturalist we're talking about, one who thinks that we and our cognitive faculties have arrived upon the scene after some billions of years of evolution by way of natural selection, genetic drift, and other blind processes operating on such sources of genetic variation as random genetic mutation. Isn't there a problem here, all right? I'm gonna argue that there is. Now, Richard Dawkins says the opposite. Richard Dawkins, um, according now I'm looking at the sheet at the second column on the first page. According to Peter Medawar, quote, one of the most brilliant of the rising, generations of bio rising generation of biologists, Peter Medawar was one of the most brilliant of the past generation of biologists, he said that Richard Dawkins, one of the most brilliant of the rising generation of biologists. Dawkins once leaned over and remarked to A.J. Ayer, the philosopher A.J. Ayer, at one of those elegant, candlelit, bibulous Oxford College dinners, and if you haven't seen an Oxford College dinner, you haven't seen elegant, candlelit, and bibulous, <laughs> and maybe you don't even know what, a, what bibulous means. It means lots of wine flowing, all right? elegant, candlelit, bibulous Oxford College dinner. He said he couldn't imagine being an atheist before 1859, said Dawkins to Ayer. 1859 being the year that Darwin's Origin of Species was published. He went on to say, although atheism might have been logically tenable before Darwin, he said, Darwin made it possible to be an intellectually fulfilled atheist, as I said at the beginning. In The Blind Watchmaker, that's what he says. And there's a quotation, a further quotation here, but I won't read that in the interest of uh, saving a little time. So Dar Dawkins thinks Darwin made it possible to be an intellectually fulfilled atheist, or he could have said naturalist. But maybe Dawkins is dead wrong here. Maybe the truth lies in the opposite direction. Um, according to, I mean, if you accept naturalism and evolution together, then the ultimate purpose of your cognitive faculties, if they have an ultimate purpose, will be not the production of true beliefs, but rather survival of the individual or of the uh, uh, species or of a group of some kind or of the genotype. That's what they'll be for, so to speak, not for the production of, that's what their our cognitive faculties, that's what their uh, ultimate purpose is. Their ultimate purpose is that of, you might say, maximizing fitness, maximizing reproductive fitness. That's what they're for, not for producing true beliefs, all right? Here's what a naturalist philosopher, Patricia Churchland, has to say on this topic, on the topic that I just mentioned. She says, boiled down to essentials, a nervous system, a brain and so on, enables the organism to succeed in the four Fs, feeding, fleeing, fighting, and reproducing. <laughs> this, um, I take no responsibility for what Patricia Churchland says. I'm merely the messenger here. That's what she says. All right. She says, uh, the principal chore of nervous systems, what they're for, is to get the body parts where they should be in order that the organism may survive. That's what they're for. Improvements in sensory motor control confer an evolutionary advantage and a fancier style of representing believing is a kind of representing, according to her, is advantageous as long as it's geared to the organism's way of life and enhances the organism's chances of survival. Okay, so that's what beliefs are for. Truth, she says, whatever that is, definitely takes the hindmost. Truth definitely takes the hindmost. 
And her thought is really this. Um, evolution, you might say, natural selection doesn't care at all what you believe. Evolution, natural selection, cares how you behave. Evolution rewards certain kind of behavior, adaptive behavior, let's say, and punishes, penalizes other kinds of behavior, maladaptive behavior. But as far as beliefs go, uh, beliefs go, evolution just doesn't care. They can be true, they can be false. As long as the behavior is appropriate, that's what counts. So what really counts is behavior, so far as what gets selected for. What really counts is behavior, not true beliefs. Okay. Now, Darwin himself, I think, uh, was aware of this problem. So, I mean, this is, I'm sneaking up on this problem for the naturalist. Darwin himself was aware of this problem. He says, with me, the horrid doubt always arises whether the convictions of man's mind, and I don't think he thought that uh, this problem didn't arise for women's minds, whether the convictions of man's mind, which has been developed from the mind of the lower animals, whether these convictions are of any value or at all trustworthy. Would anyone trust in the convictions of a monkey's mind, if there are any convictions in such a mind? So Darwin and Churchland seemed to believe that uh, naturalistic evolution, that is the conjunction of naturalism with evolution, gives one a reason to doubt that human cognitive faculties are reliable, that they produce um, more true beliefs than false. In fact, to be reliable, they'd have to produce perhaps vastly more true beliefs than false. Let's call this doubt or this question, Darwin's doubt. And my next question is, how shall we understand Darwin's doubt, all right? Well, I think the way to understand Darwin's doubt is in terms of uh, an idea that people call conditional probability, conditional probability. It sounds uh, complicated and formidable, but it's a simple idea that we all have and all employ all the time. Um, so, for example, we might say, what's the probability that Mr. X will live to be 70, given that, on the condition that, given the supposition that, will live to be 70, given that, on the condition that, he is now 35, is 100 pounds overweight, um, eats nothing but junk food, never exercises, and um, is such that his parents both died before they were 60. What's that probability? Well, that's quite low, right? You've got to say, let's, let's, it's not very likely that he's going to get to be 70. On the other hand, you might say, what's the probability that Mr. Y will live to be 70, given that, on the condition that, we're talking conditional probability, the probability of this one thing, on the condition that, or given this other thing, given that Mr. Y is now 65, that he is uh, thin as a rail, that he runs 10 miles every day, that he watches his diet like a hawk, and that he has grandparents, all of, lived to be, all of whom live to be over 100. Well, that probability is going to be much higher, right? So you've got these two different probabilities, the probability that Mr. X will live to be 70, given that he does so-and-so, the probability that Mr. Y will live to be 70, given that, and this other condition. So you get the idea of, of the probability of one proposition given that on the condition of some other, all right? So you might say, what's the probability that uh, Jock is a Mormon, given that he lives in Glasgow in Scotland? Probably quite low. There aren't that many Mormons in Glasgow. What's the probability that, say, uh, Brigham is a Mormon, given that he lives in Salt Lake City? That probability will be much higher, all right? So there you have it. That's what conditional probability is, trivial, all right? Okay. Now, um, I, think, I think Darwin's doubt can be put like this. I think Darwin and Churchland mean to propose that a certain conditional probability is low, the probability of human cognitive faculties being reliable, given that human cognitive faculties have been produced by evolution, Dawkins' blind evolution, unguided by the hand of God or any other person. If naturalistic evolution is true, then our cognitive faculties will have resulted from blind mechanisms like natural selection, working on sources of genetic variation such as random genetic mutation. And the ultimate purpose or function, Churchland's chore of our cognitive faculties, if indeed they have a purpose or function, will be survival of individual, species, gene, genotype, something. But then it's unlikely that they have the production of true beliefs as a function. 
So the probability of our faculties being reliable, given naturalistic evolution, will be fairly low. All right? We can write that as you see it there. The probability, I don't think that's a blackboard, but anyway, the probability P of R on N and E, that probability is low. Okay? You see it written there, P of R on N and E. Well, here, of course, N is metaphysical naturalism. E is the proposition that human cognitive faculties have come to be by way of evolution, as conceived in contemporary evolutionary science. And R is the claim that um, human cognitive faculties are reliable. OK, and now the question is, what's the probability of R given N and E? Darwin and Churchland propose that this probability is relatively low. OK, and I want to argue that they're right. So, OK, so now I want to tell you what the main lines of my argument are. I mean, the main, that's got really like three premises. The first one is what I've just already said, that P of R on N and E is low. And the second one is, um, two is, um, anyone who believes N and E and recognizes that one is true has a defeater for R. Anyone who uh, believes N and E and uh, sees that one is true has a defeater. This should be on the sheet. Unfortunately, it isn't has a defeater for R, all right? And then the third proposition is that uh, anyone, anyone who has a defeater for R has a defeater for any belief he takes to be produced by his cognitive faculties. OK. Now, if all that's true, first of all, let me tell you what a defeater is, just very briefly. Uh, suppose you believe some proposition Q, you believe something or other. Suppose I look into this field and I see a sheep, what I take to be a sheep. So I form the belief, that's a sheep, or there's a sheep in this field. Then you, the owner of the field, whom I know to be the owner of the field, and whom I believe to be a trustworthy person, comes along and you tell me uh, there aren't any sheep in that field, but there is uh, a sheep dog that looks like a sheep from this distance, all right? Well, then I'll have a reason to give up my belief that there's a sheep in that field. I won't believe that anymore. That's uh, what a defeater is. So a defeater is some belief you come to accept, which is such that once you accept that belief, you, can't, you can no longer accept some other belief that you have. All right? Um, another example. Suppose I read the uh, guidebook to the, the city of Aberdeen in Scotland, and it says that uh, the University of Aberdeen was established in 1596. Well, then suppose I go to a meeting about guidebooks, and uh, somebody says, you know, there are lots of guidebooks make terrible mistakes. For example, the guidebook to the University of Aberdeen made a makes a terrible mistake. It says it was founded in 19, what did I say, 1696, but the fact is it was founded in 1596, all right? Then I've got a defeater for the belief I originally formed on the basis of reading what the guidebook says about the University of uh, Aberdeen, all right? So here's the main structure of my argument. First, I'm going to argue for that the probability of R on N and E is low. Second, I'm going to argue that anybody who believes N and E and has heard my argument and knows that one is true um, has a defeater for R, for the proposition that his or her cognitive faculties are reliable. Third, anyone who has a defeater for R has a defeater for any belief that he or she takes to be produced by her cognitive faculties, right? And that's, of course, all of her beliefs. So anybody then who has a defeater for R has a defeater for 
in an E itself, since that's one of her beliefs. In an E, therefore, defeats itself. In an E, therefore, is self-defeating. In an E, therefore, is, um, is, is shoots itself in the foot and can't sensibly be accepted. That's the structure of the argument, all right? Okay, now I want to uh, comment a bit on each of these, on the, each of these premises and try to tell, explain to you why I think you should believe them. Well, going to the first one, um, and now I'm looking on page two, the second column. Suppose to avoid interspecies chauvinism, we think first not about ourselves, but about a hypothetical population of creatures like ourselves on a planet similar to Earth, all right? Darwin, you know, analogized our situation to that of uh, another speci species like monkeys. Suppose these creatures have cognitive faculties, suppose they hold beliefs, suppose they change beliefs, suppose they make inferences, um, and so on. And suppose these creatures have arisen by way of the selection processes endorsed by contemporary evolutionary thought, and suppose naturalism is true for them in this possible world. What's the probability that their faculties are reliable? What is P of R on N and E specified now, not to us, but to them, all right? Well, the first thing to see, I guess, is that it's likely that their behavior is or uh, is adaptive to their present environment or maybe to the environment of their ancestors. You know, they tell us that, uh, uh, that uh, we came to be evolved on the plains of Serengeti long ago. Uh, our ancestors were hunter-gatherers and they would run miles every day, get lots of exercise, not get very much to eat. Uh, so, so we are really so constructed that we would do best in that kind of situation. But here we are in our present situation. We don't run many miles at all a day. We get all kinds of things to eat. And uh, that's what the root of some of our troubles, all right? So these creatures we can imagine are uh, adapted either to their current environment or at least to the environment in which they uh, developed or came to be. But nothing follows so far about their beliefs. Everything depends on the ways in which their behavior is related to their beliefs. So you've got beliefs on the one hand, which can be true or false, and behavior on the other hand. And how are these two connected? Well, let's construe naturalism as including materialism with respect to these creatures. So we will think of these creatures now not as having uh, an immaterial soul or self, but as just being material objects. If you were at my lecture this afternoon, then you know what, uh, what that's all about. So we'll, we'll think of human beings, or th think of these creatures just as, but